Last week we talked about the war that is going on around us and what it means to be Jesus' people living in such a fallen world. And we recognize then that this war is not between people, but rather it is a spiritual war between principalities and powers in the unseen world. And it's being waged by actual demons and what I call little G gods who want to destroy you. But we learn too that we can take heart because when we look back over the history of the church, we see that this kind of war has happened before. And the world was a very dark and chaotic place in the times of ancient Israel. But then into that darkness and chaos came Jesus. And he brought a light. And with his light, the world was changed. And after that, then Jesus' people carried the gospel of Jesus around the world. And the light grew brighter and brighter. And in many cases, the demons were driven out. Society wasn't the same anymore. So because we have seen this happen before, then we can have confidence that it can happen again. Do you believe that? That even as our world is falling into greater darkness today, there are still those around us, maybe including us, who are willing to bring the light of Christ into the darkness, enabled by his Holy Spirit. This is a vital time to be Jesus' people. But if we are to be battle ready, there is some equipping we need to do first. We need to make sure that we are fit and equipped to enter the battlefield, don't you think? So over the next few Sundays, we're going to be taking a look at what it takes to fight this war that is going on. These are the necessary foundations for victory. Because, you know, it's one thing to say, yes, I'll stand up and fight. But it's quite another thing to make sure that we are properly armed with the tools and the principles that we need to win. So today we're going to look at one of those important principles, and that is to know the source of our strength. Because if we want to be warriors for God, then we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think there's often some confusion about what that means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So hopefully today we're going to clarify that for you. But one of the things I want to make sure you know is that the New Testament is very clear on this idea of the fact that we are supposed to be filled, that he is supposed to be living in us. First of all, that the Holy Spirit is a person, right? He's the third person of the Trinity. He is one with God. He is the Spirit of God. But he is a very real entity, and he wants to inhabit his people. And so it is, that we, it is today that we state we must be filled with the Spirit in order to stand strong. We need him in us because spiritual battles <clears throat> are waged in the battlefield of the heart of every man. And if our hearts are not filled with him, then they are in danger of being filled with something else. And the enemy is waiting to take possession when we let him. Now, Jesus talked about this in Matthew 12. And so um, if you have your Bible and you want to turn with me, Matthew 12 starting with verse 43. This is Jesus speaking, okay? But before we read it, let me just set the stage because there's this conversation that's going on right after Jesus has cast out an, a demon from a man who was um, blind and mute, okay? So if you read back in the text, you see that there's this man who's come to him who couldn't speak and couldn't see and Jesus said there was a demon in him. And so he cast it out. And when he did, that man regained his ability to see and speak. 
Now remember that this is happening in a time when demon possession was actually fairly common because of the darkness of the age that they lived in. And remember that there were these demons that were actually there taking possession of people. And so it wasn't so uncommon to find a person who was under the possession of a demon. And we don't know why this man was possessed. We don't need to know why. But what we do know is that he found freedom through Jesus. And so he was one way and he came to Jesus. Jesus set him free and he was changed. He was no longer held captive. And there were people there who were watching, of course, who wanted to discredit Jesus. Right? They didn't want to give Jesus that power or acknowledge that power in him. So they accused him of actually getting his power from Satan, saying that the only reason that he was able to control the demons was because he was in alliance with them. That was their take on that. Um, we've heard misinformation before, right? That's what this was, right? But we know that the reason Jesus was able to do that was because he had a power and an authority that was greater than that of the demon. And so the demons had no choice but to obey Jesus because he is stronger than they are. And after all of this has taken place, then Jesus goes on to say this. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest but finding none. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. And so it returns and finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. And this will be the experience of this evil generation. That's a really small text, but it has some very important ramifications, doesn't it? And let's just talk about it for a little bit, okay? Because the first thing that he's saying is that these spirits are real and that they do reside inside of people. The blind and mute man wasn't just sick or disabled. He was literally inhabited by another being that was there to oppress him. That demon had taken over his mind and body. Do you see that? This is real. The next thing we learn from that little passage is that that demon considered him his home. The demon was looking for a place to reside and he found a place inside this man. So much so did he consider it his home that when he was cast out and went to look for somewhere else to stay, he didn't find a place. And so he said, I think I'll go back home. I'll go back to that guy. Right? And then the other thing we learned from that, too, is that he didn't just go back together. He took some friends with him, his bigger and badder friends. Right? And so what we learned from that is that there is room within the human heart to hold multiple demons. Do you really ever think about that? It's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it? Because we like kind of go about doing our business and, and fighting our struggles, and we just think it's all us, right? But maybe sometimes it's not. Maybe sometimes there is something else there, an influence we weren't aware of. But here is the gist of this text that Jesus is saying. It is not enough to cast out the demon. Rather, we have to bring something in to fill us up so that he can't come back. Does that make sense to you? Because you see in the text where Jesus was saying the man was swept clean. What does that mean? He got rid of the bad stuff. Get it all out, right? Send the demon out. Get rid of whatever was oppressing you. Clean house. It's now in order. But the house was empty. And so it might have been clean, but there was nothing to fill the person up, which was stronger than the demons who would come back. This is really important for you to know. I've seen it happen in real life, and so have many of you, right? We had a friend who struggled with addiction most of his life. And I believe with all my heart that there was a demon that had a hold of him, that took hold of him when he was very young. 
and that never left. And there were times, or maybe he did leave sometimes, but it came back because there were times when he would be determined to break the cycle of that addiction, right? And he would get rid of everything in his house that was associated with that addiction. No more alcohol, just everything is gone, it's clean, I'm starting over, fresh start, I'm going to do the right thing this time. And then every day he would fight to stay sober. Maybe he would even come to church a little more or move up a few rows or make sure that he was doing the right things. But the truth of the matter is every time he went home, his house was empty. It didn't have the stuff of his addiction anymore, but it didn't have anything else. And so while he believed in God, he never, to my knowledge, asked for God's Holy Spirit to come and fill him up and fill his home. He never brought positive things in. He never invited Christian friends to come to fellowship. He never did all of the things that would have filled him up in his heart and in his home. And so a little bit at a time, those demons came back. And he would call it dabbling or or doing pretty good or, or just a little bit here and there, but nothing like before, and it was always okay for him. But eventually, we saw our friend lose his battle to that addiction. The demons won. And he died alone and defeated, even though he knew the Lord. And that has stuck with me a long time. It makes me angry because I loved him. He was our friend. And it makes me mad that he never had victory. But what I always understood was that he never filled it up with anything to take the place of those things that he was getting rid of. And so this is the point that Jesus is making, is that if we want to stand firm against the attacks of the enemy, it's not enough to kick the enemy out. We have to be filled up with his spirit. Why do we need his spirit? Because his spirit is stronger than any other spirit that can come after us. Do you believe that? Greater is he that is living in you than he that is living in the world. That's what the scripture says, right? And so if we are filled with his spirit, there is nothing that can penetrate our armor. Do you see that? We have to make sure that we are so full of Jesus. That there is no room for anyone else to come in. And that's true for individuals as well as it is for the church as a whole. But it's also the same truth for a nation and for a world. And this is the part that I didn't get of that scripture. Because did you hear what the last line said? That will be the experience of this evil generation. And so when Jesus told that story, he's not talking about a person. He's talking about a whole generation that was lost. And what he was saying is, if you don't get filled up, you're going to lose. And my friends, we have seen generations come that are losing, haven't we? We've seen generations who are plagued by addictions and by depression and anxiety. We have seen generations who are so caught up in technology or pornography that they can't let anything good come in. Our nation was founded by people who wanted to worship God freely. Do you know that? Do you remember that? Not that they were a perfect people or that they got everything right. But many people risked their lives in order to come to this land so that they could worship God the way they felt led to. And as they did, they brought the gospel to the land as well. I believe that they were filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Just as sure as the the disciples were in the book of Acts when they went and carried the gospel to all nations, there were those who brought it to this land. But over time, we fell away from that. Do you see? Over time, people 
began to compromise. They started pushing God out of the public arena. His spirit was no longer welcome in schools or government or the workplace. It was a keep religion to yourself. That's not a thing you share. You do that at home, right? Over time, the faith of our nation has been chipped away. And now we are to the place where we are seeing that what is good and holy is actually called evil by people. And what is evil is actually being celebrated and revered as good. Do you see what's happened? Our nation was empty, and so the demons have come back. And this evil generation is being taken over, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the war that's going on between the spirits and principalities. Do you see? This is war. But we're not done with the fight, are we? We're not giving up. We're not throwing in the towel. Because we're still here. And one of the things I learned from the Bible a long time ago is that no matter what's going on in the world, God always reserves a remnant of faithful people who will carry on the battle. I think that's us. Jesus knew that his followers would need help for the fight. He did. And so when he ascended into heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit. Do you remember that? Not just for his spirit to be around. Not just for his spirit to show up every now and then. But to inhabit the hearts of his people. And to empower them with his power. Do you remember in the book of Acts, we read about what happened. After Jesus went up to heaven, the believers were gathered together in an upper room. Do you remember? And it was called the day of Pentecost. And what were they doing? They were praying. Their their Jesus had left them. What are we going to do now? I bet that they were afraid. And I bet they knew that they needed help that went beyond their own abilities. And the scripture tells us that as they were there and they were praying, the Holy Spirit came down and he came into them. He didn't sit next to them. He came into them and he lit their hearts on fire. And the scripture says that it was such a powerful thing that even the building they were in started to shake. Can you imagine what that would be like? And then the people were so empowered because God's spirit was in them that they went out into this pagan world around them and started telling people about Jesus. And so they went from being afraid and huddled up together in an upper room to spreading out and taking the message of Jesus even when they risked their own lives to do so. They began talking to people and healing people in the name of Jesus, and they took his light into the world around them. That's what it looks like to be Jesus' people, isn't it? That's what it looks like to be on fire for the Lord. That's what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's what we need to look like today. There is no room on the battlefield for weak and empty Christians Every one of us is called to be filled with the Spirit. So what does that look like? Because some of you are thinking, well, that's a freaky thing, and I'm not sure I want that, right? If we're really honest. Sometimes we're unsure, right? Because to give someone else control of us is a frightening thing. But it's not frightening when you know him, right? It's not frightening when you realize that he is the greatest one and that he wants the best for you. And that he just wants to guide you and be there in you to give you strength and everything you need. So here's what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. First of all, it looks like you are attuned to the voice of God. When you are filled with his Spirit, you can hear his voice. And you can respond to it in an instant. Like a commander on the battlefield, he issues commands and you receive them and respond right? If he says, go this way, then that's where we go. If he says, you need to say this, then this is what you say. If he says, that person over there needs your help, then you go to that person over there, right? That's what it looks like to be attuned to his voice. 
The Spirit in us helps us to be open to whatever it is God is saying to us. And he helps us to know whether the voice we're hearing is his or our own or the enemy's. That's called discernment, and it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. What else does it look like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? So not only are we attuned to his voice, but we are no longer distracted by the things that pull us away from God. You see, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, there is no room for the enemy within us. Do you believe that? There is no room there for the things that the enemy wants to throw at us. And that includes willful sin, and it also includes meaningless distractions or the desire to just be numb from life. When we're filled with the Spirit, there's no room for those things, for the things in life that bring us into times of struggle or suffering. When we are guided by the Spirit, He leads us away from the things that threaten to lead us away from God. Do you see how easy it is? It's simple. That's why the new covenant is so much easier, because when we're filled with the Spirit, we don't have to worry about memorizing all the rules and making sure we know all of the rituals we're supposed to do. No, we just follow the Holy Spirit, and that's easy because He's inside of us. We don't even have to go find Him, right? The Holy Spirit will never, ever, ever lead you into sin. Do you know that? Never. When Jesus met the woman who was accused of adultery, he looked at her and he said, go and sin no more. He would not have told her that if it wasn't possible. Would he? Go and sin no more. We can live that way too if we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if he is in us, there is no room for sin, and he will not dwell where sin is present. The next thing it looks like when we are filled with the Holy Spirit is that we bear the fruit of the Spirit. And that fruit is what reveals the nature of God in us, right? If somebody wants to know what God is like, they can look at what God's people are like. And if God's people are bearing fruit, then they should be able to see, oh, that's what God is like, right? So in those pagan days when the people worshipped other gods and they were cruel and they killed people and sacrificed people and murdered their babies and did all these horrible, horrible things, that's what their God was like. But then comes Jesus, right, and he, and he brings his spirit, and he fills us, and all of a sudden, people are looking at all the Jesus people going, they don't look like the other people. I think I like those people, right? So what are the fruits of the spirit? Do you know them? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you're not sure about that list, it's in Galatians 5, Okay. And maybe there's more fruit than that, but that's some pretty good fruit right there. How do you know when somebody is filled with the Spirit? That's what their life looks like. And God is all of those things, isn't he? God is love. God is joy. God is peace. God is patient. God is kind. God is good. God is faithful. God is gentle, and God is in control. So it makes sense that when his spirit is in us, then that's the fruit that comes out of us. And Jesus said, you can identify a tree by its fruit. So an apple tree will not bear pears, right? And a good tree will not bear bad fruit. The fruit in our lives is evidence of the Spirit in us. And that's not a scary thing, is it? To be filled with those things. And finally, what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be emboldened with his strength to live in a fallen world as his witnesses. Just like the Christians of the early church did. They went from timid to bold, from afraid to brave. And because they did, the gospel spread like wildfire from heart to heart. That's what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
no longer timid, but standing up. And last week, many of us took a stand for God, didn't we? And I asked if you would take a stand for God, and the whole church stood up, and it was an amazing thing to see. But we don't want to just stand. We want to stand boldly. We want to stand as though we know we are on the battlefield. And we want to stand and be filled with God's spirit because we don't want to do it from our own, from our own power. We need to be attuned to his voice and free from distractions, bearing fruit and empowered to live as his witnesses before we ever set foot on the battlefield. No wonder we've been losing the battle for so long. Maybe you agree that there are a lot of weak and half-hearted Christians out there who are trying to make a difference out of their own power. Maybe you would see with me that the church has lost its hold on the Holy Spirit sometimes. That as we've become something that's more about entertainment or um, being happy with what's going on and that kind of thing, that we have lost this, this command of the Holy Spirit that wants to do amazing things through us. Maybe over time we have become consumers of religion instead of realizing that we are the army of God through which he carries out his work. But he doesn't put us out there on the, build, on the battlefield alone. He is with us. And Jesus said that he has given his followers authority over all the power of the enemy. Do you know that he gives us that authority when we allow his spirit into us? Do you want that kind of authority? Do you want to be filled with the spirit? Do you want to be a powerful warrior for God? I hope you do. If you're sitting there and you're thinking this morning, I, I, I want that. I'd like that power, but I'm not sure what I need to, to do to get it. Well, that's good because I'm going to tell you, okay? All right, let me tell you what it takes to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The first thing it takes is surrender. Surrender. Now, that goes against our nature, doesn't it? But I'm going to tell you, we have to come to Christ and say, Jesus, I've been trying to live life on my terms without being fully turned over to you. And so I surrender. I'm going to give you control. And for some of you, that might mean asking Jesus to be your Savior for the very first time. But a lot of you have asked Jesus to be your Savior, but the truth is you never gave over control, right? Right? And so if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the first thing you have to do is say, I give up. I know that I need you. And along the way, that also includes giving up anything the enemy can use to defeat you. Do you remember what the psalmist said? Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Show me anything in me that is offensive to you. Because you see, there are things in us that keep the Holy Spirit from coming in. I'm just going to tell you that. And part of that is a desire for sin. If there's some little sin in your life that you've been holding on to, I hope you really value it because you're probably choosing that over the Holy Spirit, right? But we need to come to God recognizing that sin in our life is an open door through which demons will enter. And maybe it's just a little thing. Maybe it's just a little bit of unforgiveness or, or a little bit of, of dabbling like our friend. Or maybe we've made excuses to why we think God's okay with this sin in my life, even though, you know, that's not what he says is okay. You see, it only takes a little crack in the door for the enemy to come in. And so we need to say to him, cleanse me. From all unrighteousness, God. Get rid of anything in me that doesn't honor you. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you want to live in victory and you want to help bring about victory on his battlefield, you do not have room inside for the things that keep you from God. You don't. But the great thing is he will take them from you if you surrender them to him and if you ask him to. 
whether it's an attitude or an action or a lust, you can turn it over to him. The devil knows your weaknesses and he is very familiar with your sin and he will use it to keep you in bondage. He will use your shame to keep you hiding in the darkness. And so it's time to confess it and let it go. So as we surrender ourselves and say, God, you can take over, we also confess that there is sin in our lives when it's there and we surrender it to God. And we say, I don't want that in my life anymore. And then, and this is the most important thing, this is the biggest way, how we get the Holy Spirit to live in us, we ask him. Ask him. Jesus, fill me with your spirit. It's as easy as that. Do you see? Here's what Jesus said. He said, if you sinful people know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask him. If you're not living a spirit-empowered life, you know what you need to do? Ask him. I know it's a scary thing. What if he takes over? It's a good thing, right? Ask him. How's it going for you apart from him? How's that fruit looking? Right? And a lot of times people look at the fruit of the Spirit and they're thinking, well, I don't really have that one. I need to work on that. You can't work on that. Because it's from the Spirit. It's not from you. So what do you do? Ask him. Ask him to fill you. Ask him to take over. Ask him to work more in your heart. And he will. The Holy Spirit wants to come into you. He is a gift sent by God to empower you to live like God's people. Ask him. It's what he's here for. And when he does, do you know what he is? He is a faithful friend. He is a guide. He is a counselor. He is a comforter. And he is a warrior inside of you. All of those things. So much better than the stupid stuff that wants to live inside of you. Than the silly tactics of the enemy who want to keep you from being effective for God. The Holy Spirit is in you. You are free to become everything he made you to be when he knit you together in your mother's womb. And I don't care if you're 14 or 94. It is not too late for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within you. Do you want to be filled up today? Do you want it? This is our call. This is our call for those of you who are ready to be warriors on the battlefield for God, to fight for our nation, to fight for our community, to fight for our families, and to fight for ourselves. Do you want the help of the Holy Spirit? If you do, then I'm going to give you a chance today to ask him. Not just for your sake but for the sake of the people around you who need you to be on fire for the Lord, who need you to be filled up. If we're going to be Jesus' people in a fallen world, we need to be filled up. Greater is he who is living in you than the one who is living in the world. Let's take hold of his power today. Last week, I asked if you wanted to respond to this message that you would stand. That you would stand and show God, I am willing to take a stand for you. Well, today, I want to ask for a response as well. If you are willing to be equipped for the battlefield by being filled with the Holy Spirit, rather than stand, would you consider kneeling? Would you kneel at the chair in front of you or at an altar? Or if you can't physically kneel, would you just move to another seat or something to show that, yes, I'm making a move for God and I want to be filled with his Holy Spirit? We're going to pray together, but I'm going to ask you right now to make a move for him. Would you do it? Don't do it just because everybody else is. 
Do it because he sees your heart and your mind, and he knows if you want to be filled with his spirit or not. He's tired of us playing games. Let's pray to him. Father God, we come before you as your children. And Lord, we have within us the desires to live for you and to fight for you. To take a stand for our nation, our community, and our families. But we can't do it on our own. And so Jesus, right now before you, we surrender. We surrender to you. We ask that you would remove anything in us that is offensive to you. Take away anything that would keep us from being close to you. Empty us out of all the demons that don't belong there. Demons, if there are any here, you get out in the name of Jesus Christ. You have no authority here in any of these people. You be gone. Now, Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we want you in us. We want you to be our friend and our counselor and our comforter. We want you to be our guide through life. And we want you to be our source of strength and power. We come before you right now, humbled to be in your presence and no longer content to just sit around and take in a message and think that was great and go on about our business, but rather we hear the clarion call to your people to take a stand for you and to allow us to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And so it is with that spirit we are here today. Fill us, Lord. Change us. Change this church. Help us to be a light in this community. Not a light of evil or hatred or or political correctness or superiority, but a light of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. We give ourselves to you because we trust who you are. Take over, Lord. Have your way in us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we ask knowing that you say, just ask and you will get. Amen.